the time of the prophets had more or less ended. Uh, the Lord speaking through Malachi the prophet, uh, the one whose words uh, make up our last book of the Old Testament canon, says to his people, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And this Elijah figure, Malachi says, will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And for the next four to five hundred years, uh, these words would be, from what we can gather, some of the last prophetic words spoken in all of Israel. And according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this prolonged period of prophetic silence was interrupted by the voice of an elusive figure in the desert named John. Uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness is how much of the gospel writers describe it, quoting words from Isaiah, uh, this man who would, again quoting Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, now for our, uh, and from our 21st century perspective, uh, John would have been a very unsavory looking character, uh, wearing as Matthew describes him, his garment of camel's hair, uh, very unkempt, very unshaven, his diet consisting of nothing more than locusts and wild honey. Uh, and although this is a very unpleasant sight for us, there is, for the gospel writers, a striking parallel going on here. For there was another character in Israel's history whom scriptures describe in much the same way. Uh, a prophet, if you read 2 Kings, the opening chapter, who wore animal skins of his own. Uh, that prophet being, of course, Elijah, uh, the quintessential prophetic figure or the prophet of all prophets of and within the nation of Israel. Uh, so the gospel writers right here from the very beginning want us to be very clear uh, that in this man, uh, in this voice crying out in the wilderness, the prophecy of Malachi has come to pass. Elijah the prophet uh, in the person of John the Baptist has made his return. The great and terrible day of the Lord has now come. Now John's message was very similar to all the great prophets of Israel. He came preaching uh, repentance, the gospels tell us, this, this impassioned message urging God's people to do an about face in their lives, uh, to remember that, that God is God, that there is only one God in this life worth worshiping and serving, you know, whatever the case. And John the Baptist reminds us that drawing close to this God, that, that being in relationship with this God really demands a radical reorientation of our lives, uh, a change of mind, a change of action, uh, a change of life. Uh, John is often a fixture during the church's observance of Advent. Uh, which comes, of course, every late November, early December. And this is a very striking thing if you think about it. Uh, December, after all, is that time of year when you and I, along with much of our culture, are busy decking the halls, you know, recalling the warm moments of our childhood and singing those endearing carols uh, as we prepare for the coming of Christmas. But John comes every year uh, during this time, slicing through all of our holiday cheer and sentimentality uh, with great ferocity. I mean, demanding from us something greater, something higher than just fond wishes for a happy Christmas. Uh, John the Baptist just simply refuses to rest. <laughs> he refuses to, to back down until our lives resemble something uh, holy. You know, usually when we think of hearing sermons about repentance, uh, we sometimes think of harboring feelings of guilt or feelings of inadequacy. Yet according to the gospel writers, there was something very appealing about John's message. Uh, huge crowds came to hear him preach. Mark even writes, uh, with some exaggeration, I'm sure, that the entire population of Judea, all the people of Jerusalem, came down to the Jordan River uh, to hear this man, to be baptized by this man. And see, what John offered was not a chance to feel guilty, uh, was not a chance to feel slighted by God in some way, but what John offered was a chance to start again, uh, to return to the God who made us and who longs to receive us, uh, the way a husband and wife, after a long absence, long to receive each other. Uh, it was, of course, uh, to John whom Jesus came, uh, receiving the same baptism John had administered to others. And like John, Jesus' message was likewise one of repentance, which indicates the, uh, the influence that John the Baptist's ministry had on Jesus. Now, like most of the prophets uh, of Israel uh, who dared to stand up to the status quo and to speak truth to power, John the Baptist met his end at the hands of King Herod at the behest of his brother's wife Herodias when John challenged the lawfulness of their marriage. And about John, Jesus said this, He is more than a prophet. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Now, as followers of Jesus, there is much worth imitating about John. 
if for no other reason than because John's entire ministry, his entire vocation, his entire purpose in life was one of pointing others to Jesus. I mean, in all circumstances, John the Baptist believed he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. Karl Barth, a pastor and just master theologian, uh, had a print of a crucifixion scene painted by the 16th century artist Grunewald uh, hanging for years in his office. Uh, and in this painting, the artist depicts John the Baptist with an outstretched arm and his elongated, elongated finger, you just cannot miss it, uh, pointing to the crucified Christ. Karl Barth once reflected that it was his desire to be that finger, uh, pointing others to Christ, bearing witness to the one who lived and died for us. And may that be our desire as well. As one theologian said, we can only approach Jesus in John's way. Only through repentance can one meet the Christ who comes.